Greetings, everyone. Hope all of you are having an absolutely fantastic day. The Lord of Nothing DLC is finally here, and with it comes 15 new subclasses. In this video, I'll break their mechanics down one by one, along with giving you my personal rating for each class. I will not review basic mechanics during this video, so if I use terms you find confusing, there's a link in the description to my breakdown of all 25 base classes, along with my playlist ranking all the classes in the game. If you enjoyed this content, please don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe for more CRPG goodness. The first subclass is Reanimator, and it's under the Alchemist class. You lose three bomb damage upgrades, and your bombs always deal one die category lower damage than normal. Obviously, destroying enemies with bombs is a big part of playing an Alchemist, so this is a massive sacrifice. In exchange, you get Corpse Studying, which is triggered when you kill an enemy and provides an alchemical bonus to attack and damage up to plus four. Alchemical is a very rare bonus, so this will almost certainly stack with what you already have. At level five, you get Simple Reanimation, which adds Animate Dead Lesser to your formula book. The spell will let you raise 1d3 plus one skeletal champions who all get a plus four alchemical bonus to strength and charisma. Remember, undead health points are governed by charisma, not constitution. Since this bonus is alchemical, you could still potentially cast a spell that provides an enhancement bonus to strength and or charisma to buff the summons even more. All around, this is fantastic, and the only issue I have with it is the spell is one round per level, so you cannot just have the summons out all the time. At level 11, you get Improved Reanimation, which adds Create Undead to your formula book. This spell will let you raise a Grave Knight or Guardian Armor, both of which are higher level Undead Summons than what you get from Anime Dead. The alchemical bonus your Undead Summons receive also increases to plus 6 for Strength and Charisma. Once again, this is absolutely fantastic and lets you pile on with Undead Summons. At level 15, you get Greater Reanimation, which adds Create Greater Undead to your formula book. This spell will let you raise a Devourer or Advanced Greater Shadow. In addition, all of your Undead Summons can make one extra attack per round. Bananas. Overall, I rank this class an A+. What an amazing pairing for Lich, a mythic path that gives you a ton of buffs for all undead in the party, and it interacts directly with alchemical bombs, potentially allowing them to do negative energy damage. Plus, you still get a 9 level spellbook from the path, so just all the way around, it's an incredible combo. Reanimator Summon still only lasts for a short duration of time, and you lose out on level 10 lit spells, so it's not a perfect pairing, but it's still pretty friggin' awesome. Next on the list is Flesh Eater. You lose 4 Rage Powers, which is obviously a huge sacrifice. You also lose Uncanny Dodge and Improved Uncanny Dodge, which undoubtedly makes you less tanky. You also lose all ranks of Danger Sense, which is irrelevant. You lose all ranks of Damage Reduction, which again makes you more vulnerable. The cherry on top is losing the Greater Rage and Mighty Rage bonuses to your Rage mechanic. Yikes! This is a whole lot to give up, but you are given a lot of mechanics in return, starting with Crush and Tear. This ability gives you a bite attack that does up to 1d10 damage along with half of your strength modifier. If you have the Animal Fury Rage power, then the bite can do up to 2d6 damage while raging. No doubt, this is a really nice extra attack that scales quite well. At level 2, you get the Devour Flesh ability, which can be used on one dragon, fey, magical beast, outsider, or undead enemy within touch range. Once this is done, for 24 hours your hunger is sated, and while raging you'll get a minor trait based upon the type of creature you consumed, along with a point of essence. When you are raging and have not fed on these creatures for 24 hours, you'll get a bonus to attack and damage up to plus 4 against those creatures, but you'll also take a negative 2 penalty to intelligence, and you'll have a 20% chance to become confused every round. You can devour the point of essence to heal yourself for an amount of points up to 4d8 plus your constitution modifier. The creature types you need to devour are plentiful in the game, so it's not necessarily difficult to keep yourself sated, but still, a 20% chance to be confused seems massive, and I am not a particularly big fan of this ability. At level 7, the traits you receive from Devouring Flesh can be used even if you are not raging 
and you can receive major traits instead of minor ones. The amount of essence you can store is raised to two. Still not feeling this class because the traits you get are based on what enemies you devour and you cannot predict what enemies you are going to face. I don't like playing musical chairs every day with my buffs. At level 11, you get Unbound Rage, which is triggered when you rage after devouring the flesh of a creature that is bigger than you are. This will automatically give you the Enlarged Person buff, providing a plus four size bonus to strength and a negative two penalty to intelligence. The legendary proportion spell is way better than this without an intelligence penalty or the need to devour anything. At level 14, you get a special ability when consuming flesh, and it can be used with a standard action and two essence points. These abilities are not affected by spell resistance, and the amount of essence you can store is raised to three. I have the same issue with this that I have with traits. You cannot predict when you'll get access to the special ability that you really want. At level 20, you get Unbound Form, which is triggered when you activate Unbound Rage and increases your size by another category while also providing a plus eight size bonus to strength on top of the plus four you already had. Increasing two sizes and getting a plus 12 size bonus to strength is bananas and definitely puts more of this class into perspective. Overall, I give this class a B. It's not trash, and I am sure there are people who will appreciate adapting to different mechanics based on what type of enemies they can devour. The kit is certainly not for me, but the capstone ability is very impressive. Next on the list is Hag Riven, a subclass under Blood Rager. You lose access to fast movement, which is just a little bit annoying. You also lose access to uncanny dodge, improved uncanny dodge, and all ranks of damage reduction, which absolutely makes your character less tanky. It's not clear from the initial screen, but Hag Riven also significantly limits what bloodlines you are able to select. You can only select Hag, Fey, Arcane, or one of the elemental options. To me, this isn't a big deal, since obviously from a role-playing standpoint, Hag is the one you should select. In exchange, you get Claws of the Hag, which are treated as natural weapons and give you an attack that scales with your level. At level 9, the Claws get the Rend ability, which allows an attack one more time when they hit twice. At level 13, they can critically hit on a roll of 19. Finally, at level 17, the Claws force enemies to pass a Fortitude save or they take 1d4 strength damage. All around, this is nice and scales well as you advance through the game. Starting at level 5, you can add an enhancement bonus to the claws up to plus 5, and as you level up, you can add different weapon properties onto the claws, such as shock, corrosive burst, or speed. This makes the claws even more viable because you don't necessarily need to use natural weapons gear to give them an enhancement bonus. Their attacks are essentially self-sufficient. Very nice. At level 7, you get a natural armor bonus of up to plus 5 to your armor class. I wouldn't say this completely makes up for losing both ranks of uncanny dodge and all of your damage reduction, but plus 5 to your AC is pretty awesome to have. Finally, at level 10, you get critical focus as a bonus feat, but it only applies to your claw attacks. You can also choose one feat that uses critical focus as a prerequisite, such as blinding criticals, and apply it to your claws. You can change this once per day, adjusting based upon what will help you the most. This is super cool, since most classes don't get enough feats to select one of these options, and they can apply nice debuffs to on your enemies. Overall, I give this class a B+. I don't think it makes sense to select it over Primalist or Blood Rider. That being said, it provides a way better hag experience than Hagbound, so there's a role-playing opportunity here that other subclasses just don't provide. Next on the list, we have Ghost Rider. You lose access to Tactician, all three ranks of Tactician bonus feats, Greater Tactician, both Charge Passives, and both Banner Passives and you are unable to choose your own mount since you must select a horse. Unquestionably, this is all a massive sacrifice in power that deeply hurts the subclass. In exchange for all of this, you get Ghost Mount, which provides a horse mount made of ectoplasm instead of flesh and bone. You also get Etheric Tether, which is triggered when the mount is reduced to zero hit points and instead gives the mount one hit point while you take all the remaining damage. We'll talk about whether or not these mechanics are helpful in a bit. You also get a Frightful Gaze ability, which forces enemies to pass a will save or they become paralyzed. At level 9, you can use this ability against creatures that are immune to mind-affecting effects, and even if enemies pass the save, they become staggered. 
Paralyze is an extremely powerful debuff, but it's doubtful your Charisma modifier will be large enough to consistently hit high level enemies with this. At level 3, your weapons are treated as magic for the purpose of overcoming damage reduction, and at level 10, your ghost mount weapons match your alignment for that same purpose. At level 5, your mount automatically ignores difficult terrain, and at level 8, it automatically gets concealment and the 20% miss chance that comes with it. This is alright, but honestly, I always have someone on my team capable of casting blur, so it's not a significant boon. At level 11, your mount speed increases by 40 feet, and at level 14, it becomes airborne and consequently is immune to ground braced effects and trip. This increase in speed is fantastic, because most likely this character is your main tank, so sprinting out in front will help ensure enemies target you first. At level 14, you also get Spiritual Bond, which has the exact opposite effect of Etheric Tether and cannot be used at the same time as that effect. I don't see this ability as useful, since the vast majority of damage sent your way will target your mount first. Finally, at level 16, once per round when your mount fails a will save, you can make a will save to shield their mind. There are some nasty effects that will saves protect you from, so the more chances to get that right, the better. Overall, I give this class a C, because I think the only reason to pick it is the cool factor. Most of the mechanics provided here center around making your horse mount more tanky, but it's already one of, if not the most tanky mounts you can have. Mounted combat was already one of the best ways to protect your main character, so a subclass that shreds most of the offensive capabilities Cavalier provides in order to provide more healing just isn't very compelling. Next up we have Separatist. You lose access to choose the second domain of your deity, and instead you get Forbidden Rites. This allows you to choose a second domain that is outside of your deity's list. All of the powers from this domain will function as if your level, wisdom, and charisma were too lower than normal in terms of effect, DC, and uses per day. This also means you do not gain higher tier abilities until two levels later. For example, when choosing the animal domain, you could usually gain a pet at level 4, but with this subclass, you wouldn't gain it until level 6. You usually get guarded hearth from the community domain at level 8, but instead you will get it at level 10, so on and so forth. The second domain must match the alignment of you and your deity. I give this class a B because it allows you to choose a deity for role playing purposes while still picking up a domain that you really wanted for its mechanics. Being able to select Ioma Day but still get the Guarded Hearth ability is actually kind of nice even if it's the poor man's version. I wouldn't choose this subclass but there's definitely something to it. The next subclass is Winter Child under Druid. You lose access to spontaneous summoning and nature bond, which prevents you from having a pet. Obviously, that is a massive sacrifice, as pets are really powerful in this game. You also lose bonus saving throws against the spells of Fae and Plants, along with immunity to poison, which in both cases isn't a big deal. In another massive sacrifice, you completely lose the ability to wild shape. In exchange for all of this, you get the Ice Subdomain, which provides a list of cold-related spells as you level up, such as Cone of Cold and Polar Ray. You'll also automatically get Body of Ice at level 8. Obviously, this class is all about focusing on cold-related abilities, so this is nice to have. You'll also get Call of Feast, which provides a steadily increasing amount of cold resistance to all your summons, along with giving them a 2d6 cold damage bonus at level 15. Your summons will also gain the effect of the Blink spell at level 10, and you are prevented from summoning fire elementals. Blink gives attacks against your summons a 50% miss chance, but their attacks have a 20% miss chance, so honestly, I am not a huge fan of the buff. At level 4, you gain steadily increasing cold resistance and become immune to being dazzled, which imposes a negative 1 penalty on attack rolls and sight-based perception checks. I believe enemies use fire a lot more than cold, so this is just okay to me, but it's not bad to have. At level 4, you also get Blizzard Servant, which provides a blizzard elemental that serves as your pet. The Servant scales as if you have 3 less levels. It has a Whirlwind of Hail ability that harms allies at first, but at level 11, it no longer affects them. By the time you reach level 16, the pet reaches a huge size and receives a plus 4 bonus to strength, plus 6 bonus to dexterity, plus 2 bonus to constitution, a plus 2 natural armor bonus to AC, the numbing cold ability, and cold resistance 30. 
Numbing cold is triggered when the servant does cold damage to an enemy and forces them to pass a fortitude save or become staggered for one round. Enemies take an additional 2d6 damage from ally attacks if they are affected by the servant's whirlwind of hail ability. At level 9, as a swift action, you can change the damage type of your spells to cold. At level 20, you become completely immune to cold damage and you become airborne, which makes you immune to ground-based effects and trip. You also are considered an outsider when determining the effects of spells and spell-like abilities. Overall, I give this class a B-. On the one hand, from a role-playing aspect, it's super cool to have a blizzard following you around and demolishing enemies with ice attacks. There also aren't very many classes which revolve around ice-based spells, so this is a welcome addition to the list. The problem is that cold is a weak element compared to fire because there are so many accessories that help you deal more fire damage. Also, having a pet on your team that is permanently huge is oftentimes much more trouble than it's worth because they block passageways and make it harder to navigate through corridors. While the mechanics you get are nice, I don't think it's worth losing the ability to wild shape and your pet. Some really cool role playing opportunities are here, but mechanically, I think it could be a little bit better. Next on the list is Tandem Executioner under Hunter. You completely lose any access to spell casting ability, which is obviously a major sacrifice. You also lose Ray's Animal Companion, which is irrelevant because there are plenty of ways to bring your pet back from the dead. In exchange for this, you get Studied Target, just like a Slayer, and your Hunter levels are used as the Slayer levels for this ability. Your pet receives the same bonuses as long as it is within 60 feet of you. This is a big deal, as Slayers don't get pets, so this bonus always just applied to you. Being able to double up on bonuses to both attack and damage is fantastic. At level 7, you can use Studied Target as a Swift action. Starting at level 4 and every 4 levels thereafter, you get a technique, which are teamwork feats that apply to both you and your pet. Some of them are really nice, such as the option that provides up to a plus 5 competence bonus on attack rolls for you and your pet, or the one that gives your pet an additional 5d6 damage when attacking enemies that have been hit at range by you. Overall, I give this class an A. Obviously, losing spell casting is huge, but the mechanics you receive in return really lean into making you a martial force to be reckoned with. Next up, we have Dual Cursed Oracle under Oracle. You must take two curses at level 1, and the penalty from one of the curses will not lessen as you level up. So for example, if you take Blackened, then the negative 4 penalty on weapon attack rolls will always remain. It won't be reduced to negative 2 at level 10. In exchange, you get additional revelations at the 5th and 13th levels. You can also choose the Misfortune or Fortune revelations in place of a Mystery revelation. Both of these are just alright, because they are triggered when an enemy rolls a natural 20 or an ally rolls a 1. Both of these cases are rare, so I would probably use revelation options elsewhere. As you level up, you'll also automatically gain more spells. At level 1, you'll get Ill Omen. At level 2, you get Oracle's Burden. And at level 3, you'll get Bestow Curse. In my opinion, none of these spells are particularly groundbreaking. Overall, I rank this class a B. There are some builds that can easily take on two curses and will benefit from the extra revelations. For most characters, the standard amount of revelations is more than enough to get everything that is needed, and adding on an extra curse won't make much sense. Next on the list is Tortured Crusader under Paladin. Your caster ability switches from Charisma to Wisdom. Mechanically, this is a stronger choice, since focusing on Wisdom raises your will saves, but it could be problematic if you wanted to focus on having a persuasive main character. You lose Divine Grace, which obviously makes you less tanky. All of your auras can only be applied to yourself, and your Lay on Hands ability can only be used on yourself, which makes your entire team less tanky. You also lose the ability to have a pet, and instead must take the Divine Weapon Bond. Obviously, this is the weaker choice, so it hurts you both defensive and offensively. You also lose access to Smite Evil, and instead get All is Darkness. This ability functions the same as Smite Evil, except you add half your Wisdom bonus 
to attack as opposed to your full charisma bonus and it can be used against any creature as opposed to only evil enemies. I personally prefer Smite Evil because the vast majority of enemies you face in this game are evil anyway and it's nice getting your full charisma bonus. Still, even a poor man Smite Evil is better than most abilities in the game so this is nice to have. You also automatically get self-sufficient which provides skill ranks equal to 3 plus your intelligence modifier and gives you 4 bonus combat feats as you level up. Both of these are absolutely fantastic and the feats most especially will make you a more fearsome martial combatant. At level 2 you get Second Chance which functions just like Lay on Hands except the healing increases to 1d8 at level 8 and at level 15 the healing becomes maximized as if you had used the maximized meta magic spell feat. Also, as I've mentioned before, this can only be used on yourself. This is a nice way to make yourself more self-sufficient, but it still really hurts to lose channeling positive energy. Also at level 2, you get Alone in the Dark, which is triggered when a party member goes down and provides you with a plus 2 bonus on attack and damage rolls, while you will also get a plus 1 bonus to AC. This bonus can stack if different party members go down. Obviously, that's a situation that should be avoided, but if you are playing on really high difficulties, it could be nice to have this. At level 4, you can convert two uses of Second Chance to get an additional use of All is Darkness. At level 11, instead of Mark of Justice, you get Final Justice, which has the same effect as Smite Evil, except the damage is doubled and the effect only lasts for one minute. Horrible downgrade. Mark of Justice is one of the very best abilities in the game, helping your entire team overcome an enemy's defenses. Giving yourself a little bit of extra damage is usually going to pale in comparison. Finally, at level 20, instead of Holy Champion, you get Unbroken Paragon, which gives you three additional uses of Lay on Hands and All is Darkness. Also, whenever you use All is Darkness, the enemy must pass a Fortitude save or become stunned for 2d4 rounds. Focusing on Wisdom is viable for this class, so you can actually get a lot of use out of this debuff. On top of all this, when you make a full attack, you get another attack at your full base attack bonus that stacks with similar effects such as Haste. BANANAS! You could combine this with something like Cleave, which is easy to get with the bonus feats, and absolutely go to town. That's a significant increase to your damage output. Overall, I will rank this class in S. Those of you who watched my original ranking of Paladin know that I put it at a C because there was no reason to choose it when you already had Sela. Now there's absolutely a reason to choose it because this subclass pairs perfectly with having Sela on the team. Let her handle all the party auras and serve as the healer. You can strictly focus on yourself and being the best damage machine you can possibly be. The only issue here is when you use Final Justice, it'll take off Smite Evil, so you might not be able to get the double damage on some bosses. But all the way around, this class is fantastic as long as you don't need to worry about helping your party. Great stuff. Next on the list is Dark Lurker under Rogue. You lose 4 ranks of rogue talent, which impacts your ability to customize this class. You also lose evasion, although this subclass can select evasion as one of its rogue talents. In exchange for this you get blind fight, improved blind fight, and greater blind fight as you level up. This is a massive boon to your character, as concealment is one of the most powerful ways enemies defend themselves from your attacks and these feats will significantly limit its effectiveness. Absolutely, it's worth trading rogue talents to automatically get these feats. At level 2 you'll get Blade from the Shadows, which is available when you are within 5 feet of a creature larger than you. As a standard action, you can step into that creature's shadow, emerge in the shadow of an enemy larger than you, and perform a sneak attack. At night, you'll get a plus 2 circumstance bonus to attack when using this ability. This is rather unimpressive to me, but at level 14, when you emerge from the shadows, you could perform a full round action, with the first attack being treated as a sneak attack. Being able to teleport and do a full round action to another enemy is actually really nice. If you create a small creature, like a gnome, then almost everyone will be larger than you and this will be available all the time. You'll also get a plus 2 bonus to initiative checks which is definitely nice to have as well. At level 20 you get blind sight, which basically means invisibility and concealment mean nothing to you. 
absolutely fantastic to have and makes you an even more dangerous martial combatant. Overall, I rank this class in S. Teleporting through shadows, seeing through invisibility, and blowing large enemies up for massive damage all sounds like a jolly good time. Both mechanically and thematically, I really like this class, and I just might do another full playthrough as a lurker. Next on the list is the Prophet of Pestilence under Shaman. You lose the ability to choose your own spirit, and instead you must take Pestilence. No loss there, as that's what this class is supposed to be focusing on anyway. You also lose the ability to select a spirit animal, which takes a small bonus away from you. Not really a huge deal. On top of this, you lose three ranks of Hex and all ranks of Wandering Spirit, which is definitely a massive sacrifice for a Shaman and limits your ability to buff allies or debuff enemies. In exchange for all of this, you get Plague's Caress, which is a melee touch attack that sickens a creature for a number of rounds equal to half your Shaman level. Sickened enemies have a negative two penalty on attack rolls, damage rolls, saving throws, skill checks, and ability checks. This is a disease effect, but keep in mind there's a new mythic ability that allows you to bypass enemies' resistance to disease. Definitely a nice debuff to have towards the beginning of the game. At level 2, you get Plague of Abaddon, which is a hex that forces an enemy to pass a fortitude save or they will become infected and receive an attribute penalty. As you level up, you get multiple opportunities to mutate this hex and choose which attributes are affected when you use it. Dealing 1d4 damage to strength, dexterity, and constitution at the click of a button certainly isn't a bad debuff, so this presents some interesting options. At level 4, you become immune to the sickened condition and get a plus 4 bonus to saves against effects that cause nausea or disease. At level 12, you get immunity to nausea along with all poisons and diseases. In addition, the DC for your disease effects increases by 2. Nauseated is a really tough condition to deal with, so having immunity to it is nice and the DC increase to your abilities is welcome as well. At level 8, any time a creature attacks you with a non-reach weapon, they must pass a fortitude saving throw or be affected by your Abaddon Hex. In addition, the range of your Hex increases to 30 feet. Whoa, now this is interesting because you don't really need to burn your standard action using the plague. You could just be a regular melee combatant and the enemies who attack you will automatically become debuffed. That's definitely nice to have and makes this subclass more viable. At level 16, any time an enemy has to roll a save against one of your disease spells or abilities, they have to roll twice and take the worst result. This will absolutely go a long ways towards making your disease effects connect more often. Finally, at level 20, you get a thousand diseases, which forces all enemies within 30 feet to pass a fortitude save or become afflicted with your Abaddon Hex. If the enemies were already suffering from a disease, they are automatically inflicted with the Hex automatically inflicting a 1d4 penalty to all of the attributes for all of your enemies is frankly kind of wild. Overall, I give this class an A. This class does take a while to get going, and I don't find the early levels to be all that appealing. That being said, automatically spreading disease to any enemy in your vicinity is very appealing, both thematically and mechanically. This class provides a compelling way to roleplay the game, and I give it extra points for that. And now, the moment many of you have been waiting for, we're touched under Shifter. Yay, yay, clack, 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 yay, yay. You lose access to all of the base Shifter forms, which doesn't really matter because you are getting new ones anyway. You also lose access to Woodland Grace, which again, isn't really a big deal. Finally, you lose access to track and instead you get Lycanthropic Tracker, which provides a plus four bonus to perception, checks, and the scent ability. Scent is irrelevant, but perception is way better than Lord Nature, so this is definitely an upgrade. You also get Lycanthropic Aspect, which is a minor form that you can shift it to using a swift action and it will provide up to a plus six inherent bonus to strength, dexterity, and constitution. You can enter this form a number of times per day, equal to three plus your shifter level. Starting at level four, you get three major forms that all increase in power as you level up. All of these forms can last permanently if you take the Master Shapeshifter Mythic ability, which you absolutely should. 
Where Rat gives you two claw attacks, a bite attack, a free disarm attempt with the bite attack, and you are able to perform sneak attacks for up to 3d6 damage. You also gain the bestial war ability, which causes nearby enemies to become shaken if they fail a save. You also get the jump up, weakening wound, crippling strike, and opportunist rogue talents. Finally, you get up to five damage resistance against everything except silver. Overall, this is an absolutely monster list of mechanics. I am especially a big fan of opportunists, which lets you do a melee attack against an enemy when they are struck by an ally once per round. Unfortunately, it seems like we are never going to get rat folk in Wrath of the Righteous, so this is probably the next best option, and yeah, you can absolutely rip up enemies with this form. The next form is Were Tiger. You get two claw attacks, a bite attack, and a bonus to AC equal to half your shifter level. The damage of your claw attacks increases to 2d8, and you get up to 15 damage reduction against everything except silver. You also automatically get the combat expertise and lunge feats. Lunge is an effect you can activate to add 5 feet of reach onto your melee attacks in exchange for losing 2 AC, which you can easily spare anyway. This is insane for your build, especially if you have another character who serves as the main tank in front of the tiger. You also get the Pounce and Fast Healing 5 abilities. If you have enough space to do a charge, automatically doing a full attack is incredible, so Pounce is really nice to have. The cherry on top is 15 points of damage reduction against everything except silver. Once again, this is a fantastic set of mechanics, and remember, you can switch between Wear Rat and Wear Tiger whenever you choose. Last, but most certainly not least, we have Werewolf. You get two claw attacks that make enemies bleed for up to five damage each round, and this effect stacks up to five times. Your enemy can pass a fortitude save to stop the bleeding. You also get a bite attack, which by level eight will automatically attempt to trip enemies. You also get the bestial war ability, along with the trip and greater trip feats, which will significantly help your automatic trip attempts to connect. Finally, you'll also get seven points of damage reduction against everything except silver. Personally, Werewolf is my favorite form. Trip is absolutely one of the best debuffs in the game because the enemy is more vulnerable when they are on the ground and all nearby allies get an attack of opportunity when they attempt to get up. The AI doesn't have foes stay down to avoid those attacks, so you are basically guaranteed free hits all the time. Most enemies in the game are capable of bleeding and it's actually useful considering how high you can stack the numbers. Overall, I give this class an S. It would have been enough for Alcat to finally let us be a werewolf, but they also added something in for the legion of people who have been begging for a rat folk race in the game. In both cases, the mechanics are incredible and if you have been fiending for a Shere Khan run, the were tiger is pretty awesome as well. All the way around, this subclass is a thematic monster and presents very strong mechanics. Next on the list is Geomancer under Sorcerer. You lose three bloodline feats, which could slow your ability to gain crucial metamagic feats. You also lose all bloodline bonus spells, which is a pretty large sacrifice for a class that doesn't get a large roster of spells as it is. In exchange, you get Geomancy, which is activated with a free action, and the next time you cast a spell, you deal 1d8 damage to yourself while giving all allies or all enemies a specific effect for one round based on the terrain you are in. For example, if you are in the Hinterlands, you'll give all allies within 30 feet an amount of damage reduction equal to twice the level of the spell you cast. Yeah, I am straight. Once again, not a fan of playing musical chairs with my buffs, especially based on the terrain that I am in. You'll also get three ranks of favorite terrain, along with the ability to select two additional favorite terrains, just like a ranger. Overall, I rank this class a D. Sacrificing bloodline feats and spells in exchange for a buff that changes based on the terrain you are in seems like a terrible idea. The fact that some of the buffs are frankly inconsequential just further solidifies that this subclass isn't worth it. Next up, we have Hag of Gyrona under Witch. You lose three ranks of hacks, which impacts your ability to debuff enemies and buff your allies. In exchange, you get a plus two bonus to persuasion checks and plus two to the DC for all spells with the fear descriptor. This feels odd considering the subclass doesn't provide any high level fear spells for you to use, but the bonus is still there. At level 8, up to 3 times per day when you use a mind affecting spell, ability, or hex, you will automatically affect the target with a greater dispel magic effect. 
boss killer. Casting Evil Eye on a boss is something you'll be doing anyway, so dispelling a bunch of its buffs at the same time is a massive boon for your entire team. At level 12, you'll get a Night Hag that serves as a special companion. At first, it will be level 12 with you, but over time, it will outpace your level and reach level 23, which of course your character is not capable of doing. It will automatically gain useful spells as you level up, including Magic Missile, Haste, Dispel Magic, Phantasmal Killer, and Cone of Cold. Having another character on the team capable of dispelling magic and casting haste while also eliminating low-level enemies with Phantasmal Killer is absolutely a fantastic addition without even mentioning the thematic pool of having a hag follow you around everywhere. Finally, you lose the ability to select a patron, but instead you form a pack with your Night Hag. This gives you a list of bonus spells as you level up, including Doom, Blink, and Disintegrate. I am not familiar with two of these spells, so they might be new. Repulsion comes at level 14, and it creates an invisible mobile field that forces creatures to pass a will save. If they fail, then they are rendered immobile, but they are still able to attack. Obviously, this could be useful if you are facing multiple enemies that must be in melee distance to deal damage, but it can also impact your party members, and the area of effect is too large to avoid them. I would probably pass on this. The other spell is Implosion, and you get it at level 18. This must be used within close range and inflicts 10 points of damage per caster level if the enemy fails a fortitude save. This will last for one round every two hag levels, and you can shift the effect to a different creature with a move action. This is really nice, but it's an evocation spell with a divine tag, which doesn't get spells like Fireball, so it's questionable how useful it is for this character to have a high DC in evocation spells. Your fear DC bonus will not apply here, so it might be very difficult to successfully use this on enemies. Not to mention your witch most likely isn't a melee fighter, so getting into close distance with enemies to apply this is problematic. Overall, I rank this class a B. It provides a fantastic hag experience with a really cool companion to boot. Unfortunately, the mechanics that are provided for your actual character leave something to be desired, so it's hard to rank this higher. We have finally come to the last subclass on this list, Shadowcaster under Wizard. You lose three ranks of bonus feats, which again slows your ability to pick up crucial meta magic options. You also lose your arcane bond, which removes a small buff to your character. In exchange for this, you get shadow spells, which provides all the shadow and many of the illusion spells to your character automatically. The shadow spells allow you to conjure an illusion of another spell, such as fireball, to deal a percentage of the damage that spell would usually do. Typically, I would say don't bother with them, but obviously, it fits in with the theme of this subclass, so let's see what else it offers. At level 5, you get Blind Sight with a range of 30 feet. If you are using melee weapons or spells that directly attack, then Blind Sight is incredible. Shadow spells summon creatures or deal area of effect damage, which doesn't care whether or not you can see the enemy, so this is kind of irrelevant for the build, which is probably why they give it to you so early. At level 7, you get Summon Shadow, which lets you summon a companion that automatically attacks your enemies. As you level up, it gets steadily more powerful and receives a plus 2 Profane bonus to Dexterity, Charisma, AC, Attack Rolls, Reflex, and Will Saves. That last part is troublesome, considering the Shadow will try to pass a Will Save to break free of you every round, and if successful, it will become hostile. The tooltip mentions the Shadow is made more powerful with the Shadow Plane ability, but I have no idea what that means. It does appear that the Shadow's Profane bonus increases every two levels, as at level 9, the Shadow has a plus 4 Profane bonus to its will saves. At level 10, you get Umbral Mind, which provides a Profane bonus to Intelligence up to plus 5. Wow, that's absolutely nothing to gloss over and will make your spell significantly more powerful and harder to resist. Finally, at level 20, you get Shadow Form, which lets you turn into a shadow for a limited amount of time, making you both incorporeal and undead. This provides a plus 2 bonus to intelligence, a touch attack that does 2d8 strength damage, immunity to ground-based effects, and a 30-foot increase to speed. You also gain the effects of the Transformation spell, which should make you a much more competent melee combatant, but also prevents any spellcasting. 
Overall, I rank this class a C+. The profane bonus to intelligence is really nice, and some of the illusion spells you automatically get are useful. That being said, using summons that easily turn against you is very unappealing, and the capstone ability completely negates spellcasting, so most of the mechanics provided are useless. That wraps up all the information I have regarding the 15 new archetypes added into the game. To recap, I gave Reanimator A+, Flesh Eater B, Hag Riven B+, Ghost Rider C, Separatist B, Winter Child B-, Tandem Executioner A, Dual Curse Oracle B, Tortured Crusader S, Dark Lurker S, Pestilence of Shaman A, Wear Touched S, Geomancer D, Hag of Gyrona B, and Shadowcaster C+. Overall, I think Alcat did an incredible job giving players some interesting mechanics along with absolutely fascinating role-playing opportunities. If Rogue Trader wasn't coming out, I'd probably dive right back into this game. Definitely looking forward to revisiting it with all of these new options. Hope all of you enjoyed this video. Take care!